Hello and welcome to episode 65 of Do More With Your Money. I am your host, TJ Van Gerven. On today's podcast episode, I'm going to share with you how I think about building an investment portfolio from the perspective of a financial planner and somebody who relies on financial planning to dictate investment decisions along with every other financial decision. So when it comes to portfolio construction, there's so many different routes you can go and it gets really complicated really quickly. And so I try to avoid that by having a framework for how I think about constructing a portfolio, especially when somebody comes to me and they have all these different accounts, all these different holdings, it can get so complicated so quickly, you really lose sight of the bigger picture here, especially from a financial planning perspective. So again, I'm not saying that my philosophy is the very best philosophy. I think there's many ways to accomplish investment success, but there are some principles that I think translate across any type of investment strategy. And a few of those principles are number one, discipline. Like, do you have a rules-based strategy? I think if you're making decisions on a whim, then you're going to end up having inferior returns and really trailing, you know, what financial markets provide. And it's really important to humble yourself and understand that historically, it's very difficult to beat the overall market. When we talk about you know buying and trading securities within the market, that's more of the zero sum game of investing where if you're getting in and out of different securities, you know, you're trying to create superior performance, but just by buying and holding and, and growing with global stock markets, that's the non-zero sum game of investing where the world is growing populations are growing, new services and products are being created by companies, and you're benefiting from that as an investor in the global stock market. So as a starting point, to keep it simple, I always look at it from a top down where you're viewing the collective global stock market and you're owning everything as it's currently constituted. So the way I think about this is market capitalization. So owning the biggest companies based on how big they are. And you know, some people would get really upset by that because they say, oh, that's a really poor way to invest. You don't want to own the biggest companies. You want to have equal weight strategy, whatever. I mean, there's definitely merit to all these different strategies. And I agree, that's what I'm trying to say is that there are you know, more than one way to skin a cat. And you can argue that historically, maybe being equal weight, not owning you know, the largest cap weighted companies is a good thing because there's reversion there and those companies don't remain on top forever. But Again, if you're familiar with more of a Vanguard type passive strategy where you're just owning the stock market as it's constituted by market capitalization, historically, that's been a pretty good way to invest net of fees and net of taxes because, you know, those are things that are in your control. And a lot of times the underperformance of professional managers is due to fees, due to taxes, and due just to the fact that, you know, markets are pretty efficient over, you know, the midterm at least, maybe in the short term, they're not super efficient at times, but they tend to correct themselves. And so it's very hard to find mispricings and securities. And so, you know, typically having a passive strategy works out for you. So when I'm thinking about portfolio construction from a financial planning standpoint, it always starts with the financial planning before even you talk about portfolio. So it's like cash reserve. You know, you kind of got to earn the right to invest. And what I mean by that is you understand your personal finance fundamentals, how much money you actually need to live off of. And do you have a dedicated cash reserve where you feel like that'll last you, you know, three, six, 12 months, whatever you need where you don't feel like you're ever dependent on your investment portfolio. Because a really bad situation to be in is one where Um, you need money, you don't have a dedicated cash reserve, and now you need to pull from your investments and you're at the mercy of the market because if the market is going haywire and it's it's an inopportune time to buy, let's say you're in a pretty bad prolonged bear market, and if you give yourself the time to stay invested, you'll come out on top. But if you withdraw when the market is down substantially, that could really impact long-term returns. So by having that cash reserve, it provides this hidden return that gives you that flexibility to stay invested. It's hard enough to stay invested from a psychological standpoint, but if you actually need to withdraw from your portfolio because you just need money, then that's gonna create some some bad things, you know, potentially if there is a prolonged bear market. So that's the first thing is having that dedicated cash reserve where you know you can pay 
X amount of months in living expenses and not need to pull from your portfolio, that should give you time to weather any storm. Even if, and this is super important if you're in retirement or if you're like taking a work sabbatical and you're dependent on your investments, super important. But even for the accumulator who's not touching their investments, it's still important because it gives you that additional layer of peace of mind. Maybe you don't need as much cash on hand. Maybe you don't need that, you know, year, two years of cash if you're not dependent on your investments, but still enough to give you that peace of mind. So assuming you have that, you keep that separate from your portfolio allocation. So I don't factor in that cash reserve into the overall allocation. That's just what you need to stay invested. Now we start to get into what the actual portfolio construction looks like. And again, my biggest things from a planning standpoint are how much stocks you own, equities, same, we use those words interchangeably, how much bonds you own, aka fixed income, we use those words interchangeably. So bonds, fixed income, cash those are really the main things i look at you can start to talk about alternatives like commodities or alternative strategies not a big fan of those so i don't typically you know recommend those unless there's a unique situation where somebody's interested in that so it's really stocks bonds cash and then you know the newer thing especially for the younger folks is cryptocurrency so i would include that in kind of that alternative bucket but for simplicity, let's just focus on stocks and bonds because it, believe me, it gets complicated enough with that. So when it comes to portfolio construction, the most important thing is that you are understanding your asset allocation across all of your various accounts. And what I mean by asset allocation, that means how much are you allocating to different types of assets? So how much are you allocating towards the stocks? How much are you allocating towards bonds, AKA fixed income? And then you have all these accounts, you know, a lot of times people have, you know, a 401k at work um, and a traditional IRA, a Roth IRA. Sometimes they even have a SEP IRA and in addition to that, a joint investment account, an individual investment account, um, equity compensation through work, all these accounts. And, you know, a lot of times it can be easy to get caught up in the selections in each individual account. But at the end of the day, what really matters is the overall asset allocation across all of the accounts. So the first thing to understand is, do I have a system, do I have software where I can just take a nice, big, top-down look at what my total investable assets are and what my current asset allocation is? So that's the first thing. Now, when thinking about stocks versus bonds, if you're not familiar, stocks are ownership in a company. A bond is a debt obligation that can be issued by uh, U.S. government, by companies, and there's different variations of, uh, you know, default risk and inflation risk. I don't want to get into the technical stuff because, again, you can get into so much of this and it's just not important a lot of times, in my opinion. So stocks are seen as riskier than bonds in the short term because they have more standard deviation. Uh, when you own a piece of a company, there's no right there to receive anything. If there's no profits, if there's no dividends to, to distribute, then it's all dependent on the performance of that company. With a bond, they are required to provide you an interest payment and then they return the payment, the uh, the coupon amount, the premium, whatever the initial, the initial amount was paid at the end of when it matures. But they group these bonds together in the form of an uh, ETF or mutual fund. And so you can own these, you know, collectively and they move very differently from stocks because again, they represent less risk in the short term. But in the long term, they can actually be more risky than stocks because historically, stocks have been one of the best performing asset classes uh, because again, if you're holding for the long term and you're owning a diversified bundle, you're going to benefit from the Amazons of the world, right? Cuz you're owning everything, so you're you're guaranteed to own the biggest winners. You're also guaranteed to own all the losers, but the winners tend to outperform the losers. And so, you know, in the long term, you're hopefully preserving your wealth because you're also inflation is occurring where the value of your dollar, the purchasing power of that dollar is decreasing over time. And so by owning these companies, you're storing your wealth there. And yes, there's risk in the short term. This is, this is why it's important to have a cash reserve. But in the long term, if you give yourself enough time to invest, historically speaking, 
you should come out on top the longer your time horizon is. So that's the biggest thing to understand. First off is the longer you're investing time horizon the, before you need to actually access that money, the more risk you can take on in the short term with equity risk and the less, you know, uh, fixed income exposure that you should want to take on just because again, that bond component is really there as a shock absorber. It's the, it's what lies in between your cash reserve and your stock portfolio. So, you know, people right now talking about inflation risk, talking about interest rates rising and, you know, they're saying that what is the value of even owning bonds in your portfolio? And it's true. If you have a really long time horizon, then maybe you don't need to own that much bonds, but it still acts as the psychological shock absorber between you and your cash reserve. You know, a lot of times people overestimate their tolerance for risk when there is a substantial bear market or even a correction where they see their portfolio drop, you know, 20, 30 percent in the span of months that's really hard to stay invested. And having that fixed income bond exposure, it, ha it has characteristics where when the stock market is down, especially if you're owning more of like US Treasury type bonds, that's gonna hold up well because those are guaranteed by the US government. And so they're seen as a safe haven asset and that allows it to kind of, um, again, absorb the shock there and then you can talk about rebalancing and things like that. So. It's important from a risk management standpoint. But again, the longer your time horizon, the more you can argue that you don't need as much fixed income exposure. So, you know, it gets somewhat subjective when you're talking about how much to allocate towards stocks versus bonds. But the first thing is, is what is your investing time horizon? If you are actually dependent on your investment portfolio, then it, it depends on how much you're withdrawing. And this is why it always comes back to financial planning. If you understand your spending needs, then you can talk, you can start to think about historically, what could I withdraw from this portfolio given expected returns? And you can, you can turn these expected returns down. The important thing is to make conservative assumptions. We don't know what the future holds, but as a financial planner and through financial planning, we make reasonable assumptions based on what we know historically, based about what we know is in our control, and then we give ourselves flexibility to adapt on the fly. So if you're in the accumulation phase, how much stock you own is gonna be slightly subjective based on your tolerance to accept that risk. So you can go as high as 90% of your investments in stock, 95%. You know, Maybe you still wanna have a little bit of shock absorber there, right? but that's gonna come down to your tolerance of risk. Now, if you're talking about from a financial planning standpoint, your capacity, so this is different than tolerance, your capacity is what you can actually take on for risk where you're not going to um, devastate yourself financially, especially if you are living off your investments, right? So if you are living off your investments, you can't necessarily experience that volatility because if you're withdrawing during really high volatility times, you could be subject to like this sequence of returns risk, where if you have really poor returns in the beginning and then you're withdrawing from your portfolio, that can really negatively impact you know later sustainability. So that's why it's not just about the returns, it's about the sequence of returns. And so by having more fixed income, you can reduce the variability of the portfolio. So once you narrow down how much stock you own, uh, you want to own, how much fixed income you want to own, you also want to consider the global allocation. So this is another thing that I start off with as a kind of generic slate is we want to own not just U.S. stocks. We want to own the global stock market because there's no guarantee that U.S. companies will continue to be the best performing company. So historically, the U.S. stock market over the last 100 years has been the best stock market. But back then, we didn't know that it was going to work out the way it did. There was a lot of risk there. And so that was why people were compensated for that risk. But moving forward, you know, because the U.S. stock market is so high, there's a reason for that because it's in a lot of ways seen as, seen as less risky because the companies have been so good historically. But there's no guarantee that these companies will continue to be the innovators of the future and will drive profits. So by owning companies from around the world, and again, I would argue for owning them uh, relative to how large they are currently, you're diversifying your stock position where you can benefit from the growth of the global economy.
And so, you know, you can look at target alloc or market capitalization for how much international stock represents relative to the global equity market. And then base that. So if you're going to have 90%, let's just say for generic purposes, you have 90% of your investments in stock. And then the global stock market, let's just say for simplicity, represents 50% of the global market capitalization that would argue for owning 45%, which is 50% of 90% of your stock allocation in global equity markets. Again, you can argue that based on different you know, factors that maybe that's not the most optimized way to do it. It's a starting point because every point you do after that, if you start to um, tilt towards certain types of things, you might be familiar with like the small cap premium, value premium, where you start to shift towards owning smaller companies or more companies with value type characteristics. Historically, those factors have added out performance, but that is going to be more of an active bet where you're starting to deviate from just that passive owning how things are currently constituted, which is totally fine. It's just you have to understand that that is the tilt that you're choosing. And then you're going to want to remain disciplined for a long time, because if you really want to benefit from those kind of factors, if you believe in that kind of uh, investment philosophy, it can take a really long time to actually experience the outperformance there. And there could be long stretches of underperformance, which from a behavioral standpoint may be hard to stay invested. So this is where it gets complicated <laughs> because again, you can have the best investment strategy, but if you can't stick with it, it doesn't matter. And that's why I always say the best investment strategy is the one you can stick with, the one that you can stay invested with. Because it, even if it's the best strategy, and you're ha but you're having these massive deviations in performance or underperformance, it's going to be hard to really stay invested because you might lose your conviction in that strategy. So you need to have conviction in your strategy. And that's why I say at the end of the day, I have the most conviction when it comes down to simple portfolios because we haven't even talked about asset location and tax planning because once you have your allocation down that you have conviction in for at least you know a certain time horizon then you want to start to think about asset location you know certain types of investments are going to be more uh, tax efficient so for example you know you tend to want to own stocks in a taxable account because then you can actually if there are losses you can harvest those losses and use them to offset other gains even offset your earned income a little bit whereas you know a fixed income is going to pay a dividend which you're going to be taxed on in the current year and by ho by owning that in a tax deferred retirement account you can defer those dividends and not be taxed on it so Again, these things are small, but as you build your net worth can add up to substantial tax savings. So it's not just about the asset allocation, it's about the asset location and how you're owning different types of investments, where you're owning them, etc. And then also, you know, once you have your allocation down and what type of investments you're using, which I'm not going to get into because again, we could talk ETFs, mutual funds, providers, all this stuff. My only thing to tell you is that simpler is typically better because again, if you are interested in you know discipline rebalancing, where if there is a drastic market environment and you hit a drift parameter where certain investments are down a certain percentage relative to what you would like to have their target weighting be, you might want to rebalance there. And so by having less you know actual investments that it'll be easier to rebalance and you won't have to be like, okay, well, <laughs> this, you know, this represents this and creating, you know, like kind um, categorizations and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's a million different rabbit holes to go down on this. I think the main takeaways you should have from this are simple is better. At the end of the day, understand your cash reserve, understand how much stock you own, how much fixed income you own, Ideally, a global allocation. Once you have that down, then you're thinking about, which is based on your investing time horizon, plus your capacity to take on risk from a planning standpoint, which you would probably want to work with a financial planner to help you determine what that looks like from a technical standpoint. And then prioritizing investments in certain types of accounts based on tax efficiency and then understanding the rebalancing rules for what you want to rebalance. Meaning that if stocks have a really bad period and your bonds hold up or even increase, you know, are you going to rebalance back to that target allocation? Again, based on the, your time horizon, based on your capacity for risk. 
So that's a little bit of insight into how I think about portfolio construction. Hopefully I didn't use too much jargon. Hopefully it wasn't too complicated. I mean, it's, it is a lot more complicated than that, but it is also only as complicated as you need it to be. And a lot of times people make it more complicated than it needs to be. And so I really try to focus on the things that really add, you know, value, whether it's tax alpha, um, you know, generating alpha is hard in general, but like there's other ways to add value. So, and those are the few of the things that I, you know, think about and come to mind first. So that's all I have for you today. As always, I'd recommend you join my weekly tips list. Uh, you can join in the show notes. Each week I provide three tips in the areas of financial independence, tax optimization, and equity compensation, as well as my favorite tweet of the week. You can also join on my website, Modern Wealth Builders, and hit the join weekly tips tab. I hope you have a great rest of your week. Lastly, I want to remind you to do you. Because in a world of increased commoditization, nobody can replicate you. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. None of the information provided in this podcast is intended as investment, tax, accounting, or legal advice.